was feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in. But you couldn't figure out just what it was. And you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. Hello everyone and welcome to our video series on the Hebrew Revelation, James and Jude. This is session number one, the book of Revelation, an authentic Hebrew manuscript. At HebrewGospels.com, we are very thankful to Yahweh to have released the first ever complete English translation and Hebrew transcript of an authentic Hebrew manuscript of Revelation. Anyone can access this translation for free at HebrewGospels.com slash Revelation. So if we click here on View Transcript and Translation, it opens up the PDF translation in a web browser. If you're viewing this on a computer, you can use the bookmarks here on the left-hand side of the screen to easily navigate across this document. If you're viewing this on a mobile phone, just scroll down to the next page and you can click on any one of these headings and it will take you to the correct page in the translation where that section starts. But ideally, you should really download this translation. So let's go back to Hebrew Gospels and I'm going to right click on the download button and choose save link as and I can download this translation onto my computer. So let's open this downloaded translation. Now, as you can see, it displays two pages at a time, and that's ideal if you want to study the transcript and translation. So let's use the bookmarks on the left-hand side and scroll down to transcript and translation, and you can see the Hebrew text displays on the left-hand side, while the English translation displays here on the right-hand side. So you can easily compare the Hebrew versus English uh, text here. Now let's just go back to the copyright information. Some people see this page and they think, oh no, this is copyrighted, we can't use it. Let's read what it says. This license allows you to share, copy, distribute and transmit the work for non-commercial purposes, providing attribution is made to the author. So you are allowed and encouraged to share this PDF translation with anyone. And you're even allowed to quote verses from this translation as long as you reference HebrewGospels.com so that others can also download their own copy of this translation for free. Now, a very important section in this translation is called Evidence of Authenticity and Interesting Readings. So what we want to do today is we want to discuss one interesting reading and one evidence of authenticity that is covered in this introduction to our translation. And that is to encourage you to go and read this whole section for yourself, because in the following videos in this series, we're not going to work through all the interesting readings already covered in the introduction. We're going to talk about new interesting readings and new evidences of authenticity that were not already covered in this document. Now, first of all, why is it important to know that this Hebrew manuscript is authentic? You see, we did not just grab the first best manuscript of Revelation and translate that. In fact, there are many copies of Revelation in Hebrew, and most of these are not authentic. What does that mean? It means that most manuscripts of Revelation, even if they're written in Hebrew, do not preserve the original Hebrew text, but rather their translations from Greek back to Hebrew or from Aramaic back to Hebrew. So here's an example. This is the British Library, Sloan 237. And this manuscript has received a lot of hype on the Internet and a lot of people talked about it and made videos about it. However, if you carefully compare the text in this Hebrew manuscript with the Syriac Peshitta, you will see that it's virtually the same. This Hebrew manuscript 
seems to be a direct translation from the Peshitta Aramaic back into Hebrew. So it's not the original text, it's just a translation. Here's another example. This manuscript is from the National Library of France, and it contains the whole New Testament in Hebrew. However, if you compare this with the other versions of the New Testament, you'll see it's basically the same as the Greek and or Latin versions of the New Testament. So this is just a translation back to Hebrew. And it's actually a poor translation. Let me show you an example here. This is Revelation chapter 1, and it says, Ani Alpha wa Omega. I am Alpha and Omega. They couldn't even get that back into Hebrew. Now, something very interesting in the Hebrew revelation that we've been translating is that it never uses Alpha and Omega even once. And you can go read more about that in the section about interesting readings in our translation. Now, one last thing I want to quickly point out here. Some people say, oh, look at that, the name Yehovah with the full vowels. Wow, this must be an authentic Hebrew manuscript. But that's a lot of hype. And it's a big misunderstanding. Because the name yod Hey with these vowel points occurs even in direct translations from Greek back to Hebrew. This is the France Daily translation. Everyone knows this was translated from Greek back to Hebrew. And it uses the name yod Hey with the vowels of Adonai. Remember, by tradition, the Jews didn't pronounce the name yod Hey. They read it either as Adonai or Elohim. And that's why they also put Adonai and Elohim's vowels on the name yod Hey. And unfortunately, that gave rise to the false pronunciations Yehovi and Yehovah. But those are just Adonai and Elohim's vowels. We have a whole video series about that. Now, the exact place where the name yod He appears in a manuscript could help to show whether it's authentic or not. But not just the fact that the name appears, and especially these vowels of Adonai don't prove anything about authenticity. So let's go back to the translation, evidences of authenticity and interesting readings. That's why this whole section is important, because it shows you that this Hebrew manuscript that we've been translating is not just a copy from Greek or Aramaic back to Hebrew, but rather it preserves the original Hebrew text of Revelation. So let me also show you what the manuscript looks like. We obtained special permission from the Cambridge University Library to reproduce photos of the translated folios of this manuscript. This is 00.1.16 from the Cambridge University Library. So as you can see, uh, this Hebrew revelation is written in a very small cursive script. And um, after trying to read this manuscript, you might appreciate the transcript a bit more. So to navigate from the manuscript back to the transcript, you just click at the folio number here at the top of the page, and it takes you back to the transcript in block letters, which is easy to read. And to go back to the manuscript, we just click on the folio number here, and it takes us all the way back to the correct page of the manuscript. Now, some people say, okay, you claim that this manuscript is authentic. Does that mean that this Hebrew manuscript of Revelation is older than all other Greek copies of Revelation? And the answer is no. This Hebrew manuscript is not older than all other Greek copies of Revelation. And so people wonder, how can we say that this is authentic? So today I want to show you very clearly that authenticity does not depend on age, and age is not equal to authenticity. First, I'm going to show you an example from the Hebrew Old Testament versus Septuagint translation, and then I'll also show you an example from the Hebrew Revelation versus the Greek Revelation. So in our example from the Old Testament, we're going to study Psalm 56, verse 9. And to really emphasize this point that authenticity does not depend on the age of a manuscript, 
I'm going to make a fresh copy of this verse in Hebrew. I'm going to copy this from the Masoretic text while you're watching. So, this verse says in Hebrew, Nodi safarta ata, you yourself have numbered my wanderings, sima dim ati ve no decha, place my tears in your bottle, halo besifra decha, are they not in your book? So that's the Hebrew text of Psalm 56, verse 9. Let's go ahead and compare that with the Greek Septuagint translation. So at the bottom of the screen is the famous Codex Vaticanus. It's one of the oldest Greek manuscripts of the Old and New Testament. And quite naturally, people are inclined to think that if it's older, it's better. If it's older, it's more authentic. This Greek manuscript is roughly 1,650 years old. So let's do the math. Let's say that the Hebrew text at the top of the screen is about three minutes old at the time of this recording. And the Codex Vaticanus is roughly 1,650 years old. If you do the math, you'll see that that means the Codex Vaticanus is almost 300 million times older than the Hebrew text at the top of the screen. However, everyone knows and all scholars agree that the Old Testament was first written in Hebrew and then translated from Hebrew into Greek. No scholar in Hebrew and Greek will tell you that the Old Testament was first written in Greek and then translated into Hebrew. So that's a fact. Everyone knows it doesn't matter if this Hebrew transcript at the top is a new, fresh transcript. It's not even a manuscript. It doesn't matter that the Codex Vaticanus is 1,650 years old. That's just the translation. Now, although it's a fact and everyone knows this, we can also prove this linguistically. And one of the ways in which we can linguistically prove which text is the original and which text is a translation is wordplay. That's one of many evidences, but let's focus on wordplay in this Hebrew uh, verse from Psalm 56. That first word marked in blue is pronounced as nodi. Nodi means my wandering or my wanderings. The E at the end just means my. So the word nord here means wandering. And then further down in the verse, it says venodecha. The V is in, the echa at the end is your, and nord in the middle means bottle. That's the Hebrew word for bottle. And just to clarify, it refers to a skin bottle, not a glass bottle. So this is called a Hebrew word pun. Because these two words, nod and nod, sound exactly the same when you pronounce them. That olive is silent in the word nod. So if you're going to listen to someone reading this text in Hebrew, you're going to hear nod and nod. And it's going to catch your attention. And you're going to think, what's he trying to say? What's the meaning? And um, it's obvious it can't have the same meaning in both occurrences. So this is a Hebrew word, pan. This is internal beauty and internal authenticity in the Hebrew text. This Hebrew verse in Psalm 56 verse 9 also contains a second Hebrew word play. And this is called internal rhyme, also known as paranomasia, where the same root letters are repeated. So this word is safarta. That means you have numbered or counted. And the root here is safar, samek, pei, and reish. And that root word means to count or to write. And then right at the end of this verse, we have besifra techa. The be is in, the techa at the end means your, and sifra means book. And sifra is from the same root, samek, pei, Reish. So the same root word 
is repeated twice in this verse in Hebrew. So there's two Hebrew word plays in this one verse in the Hebrew text. What happened to these word plays in the Greek translation? Let's see. The first Hebrew word Nord was translated into Greek as Zoein, meaning life. So Nordi, my wandering, in Greek became Ten Zoein Mu, meaning my life. So can you see they're interpreting the text, trying to explain the meaning. But it's just a translation and an interpretation. It's no longer the original. Then the second occurrence of Nord in Hebrew which is now the pun with the first occurrence, in Greek that became enopion, venodecha enopion su. Now in Greek that means before you, not in your bottle. So again, they're changing the meaning, interpreting the text, trying to explain to you what they thought it meant. But can you see what happened to the word pun? It was lost in the Greek translation because zoein and an opion don't sound the same. So it's not going to catch your attention. It's not a pun anymore. And the original authenticity is lost in the Greek translation. It doesn't matter if this Greek manuscript is millions of times older than the Hebrew text. We can prove linguistically which one is the original and which one is the translation. What happened to the second Hebrew word play? In this verse, in the Greek translation, the Hebrew word safarta was translated in Greek as exengela. Safarta means you have numbered, and exengela means I have proclaimed. So they changed the meaning. And then sifra, book, was translated in Greek as epangelia, meaning promise. Now, as you can see, these two Greek words marked in red do look a little bit similar. And that's because these two words both contain the element of angelo to announce in them. However, in Hebrew, safarta and sifra are from the exact same root. They're not compound forms. In Greek, these are two compound words. The first is a compound verb, and the second is a compound noun. So in Greek, only half the way that these two words are formed is the same. So there's still a little bit of wordplay left here in the Greek translation, but it's not nearly as impressive as in the original Hebrew version. And this will also help to explain why in the Greek New Testament there is still some wordplay. And many people will say, wow, we've got Greek wordplay in the New Testament. It was originally written in Greek. But you first need to compare the Greek and the Hebrew versions. And then it will become very clear which one is the original and which one is the second-hand translation. Now, let's do the same thing with the Hebrew revelation versus Greek revelation. We can show linguistically which is the original text and which is the second-hand translation. So this example is from Revelation chapter 2, the letter to Smyrna. Now, in any translation you can see that there is keyword repetition in this letter. And, for example, in the introduction, at the beginning of the letter, it says, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. In the exhortation, in the middle, it says, be faithful unto death. And in the promise, right at the end, it says, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So the word die or death is repeated three times in this short letter. But this keyword theme can be seen in basically any language, in Greek, Hebrew, Latin, Aramaic, English, Afrikaans, you name it. So this cannot show that any particular version is the original. However, in the Hebrew version of Revelation, a second keyword theme is visible in this letter to Smyrna. And this keyword theme is based on the word suffering in Hebrew, tsa'ar. So in the acknowledgement at the beginning, it says, I know your works and your sufferings. In the exhortation, it says, you will have suffering for 10 days. And in the promise right at the end, it says, 
Whosoever overcomes will not have suffering from the last death. Suffering, suffering, suffering three times. At the beginning, in the middle, and right at the end to tie everything together. Now, let's compare the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic versions of Revelation chapter 2. And it's going to be obvious which one preserves the original wordplay and keyword repetition and which versions are merely translations. Here's a table showing the three occurrences of Tsar in the Hebrew Revelation. This is Tsarotecha, your sufferings, Waha Tsar, and the suffering, and the Tsar, suffering. The same word repeated three times at the beginning, in the middle, and the end of this letter to Smyrna. Let's compare the Greek version. The Greek version uses sleepsin the first time. That's the Greek word for tribulation. And then it is repeated a second time, sleepsin, tribulation. But then right at the end, where the Hebrew repeats the same word a third time, the Greek simply has adikethe, meaning will be hurt. Now, maybe you can see a logical connection between tribulation and will be hurt. But there's no linguistic connection between the two. There's no wordplay between these two terms in Greek. And the same in Aramaic. We have Utsanah, your tribulation. Utsanah, the tribulation. And then right at the end, Nehar will be hurt. And the same in Latin. The word for tribulation appears twice, and then the word for will be hurt, which is totally different, right at the end. So can you see part of this keyword repetition was preserved in the Greek text and in the Aramaic and in the Latin. But it wasn't fully preserved. It's not repeated a third time to tie the whole thing together right at the end. But in the Hebrew, because it's repeated a third time, you can see this is intentional. This is internal authenticity and internal beauty in the Hebrew text. Now, did you know that this Hebrew word play cannot be reclaimed from the Greek translation. So let's just go back to our example of the Hebrew Masoretic text versus the Septuagint. We discussed just now how that most of the Hebrew word play was lost in the Greek translation. Okay, now what would happen if we take the Greek text of Psalm 56 verse 9 and translate that back into Hebrew? Will we be able to reclaim the original Hebrew word pun? And the answer is a clear no. Why not? Because this phrase, tenzoen mu, means my life. In Hebrew, that would be chayai, not nodi. So you'll never get back to nod in the first occurrence. And then the second word that forms part of this pun in the Hebrew version in Greek, that became enopion. Now, enopion su means before you. And in Hebrew, that would be lefanecha or negdecha. So if we translate the Greek text back into Hebrew, we're going to have chayai and lefanecha or chayai and negdecha. And there's going to be no word pun. You cannot reclaim this from the Greek version. It's the same here in this example from Revelation chapter 2. And let me show you some examples of this. Ginsburg's translation was made from Greek back into Hebrew. Okay? He used tsaratcha, tsara, and yifgabo. The same word repeated twice based on the Greek text, but not a third time. Why not? Because in the Greek text, the same word is not repeated a third time. And so as a translator, Ginsburg was faithful to his base text or source text, and there's no way that he can reclaim the original Hebrew wordplay. The same is true in the Dalich translation. You have Tzaratcha, Batzara, and Yinazek. The same word is not repeated a third time. And the same in the Sloan 237 manuscript that people have talked about and made such a big story of it. It's just translated from the Aramaic back into Hebrew, and so it repeats. Hatsara, Hatsara, the same word twice, but not a third time. The third time it says Yenuga. 
doesn't sound even close to tzara. So can you see, you can never reclaim this Hebrew word play from the Greek or Aramaic or Latin versions. And yet this Hebrew manuscript on the Cambridge University Library has this word play where it's repeated three times. Where does this Hebrew text come from? It doesn't come from the Greek, Aramaic, or Latin versions, and it preserves Hebrew wordplay. It shows the same signs of authenticity that we see in the Hebrew Old Testament. So very clearly, the Hebrew version of Revelation, contained in 00.1.16, preserves the original readings, the original vocabulary, the original wordplays, the original text of Revelation. So this was just one out of many evidences of authenticity. We now looked at Hebrew keyword repetition. Uh, some other very important evidences of authenticity are gapping of explicit subject, gapping of explicit object, and mistranslation in the Greek version. And so be encouraged to go and read all of these topics for yourself. Right now we want to move on and discuss one interesting reading in the Hebrew Revelation. How can the tree of life be on both sides of the river? If this Hebrew Revelation really preserves the original Hebrew text, then we're expecting that it would help solve certain contradictions and inconsistencies and difficulties that exist in the Greek text. So, is there anything that we can learn about the tree of life? Let's start by reading Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, when translated from Greek. It says, On both sides of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations. So if you read this translated from Greek, it's pretty clear that there's one tree growing on both sides of the river, one tree bearing 12 kinds of fruit, one tree with enough leaves to heal all the nations. Really? Now, people like to say, oh, this is just a miracle. And people imagine all kinds of explanations like, oh, the tree of life has a split trunk. It grows across the river and it literally stands on this side and that side and it meets up in the middle and it's one tree of life. But that doesn't explain enough leaves to heal all the nations. That doesn't explain the 12 kinds of fruit. Have you ever read Genesis chapter 1, where Elohim created everything, and he says, according to their kind, according to their kind, according to their kind, over and over and over. Elohim never created one tree to bear 12 kinds of fruit. Elohim never created one animal to give birth to 12 kinds of animals. Even in the New Testament, it says, you will recognize them by their fruit, for a tree is known by its fruit. Even James has said, can a vine bear figs? Meaning, can one kind of plant bear various kinds of fruit? That's impossible. So, is Elohim really going to change his mind after all and make a new kind of tree with 12 kinds of fruit? That doesn't match the rest of the Bible. It doesn't match the character of Elohim. So, is there any insight that we can get from the Hebrew revelation? Not just speculation and imagination. Let's see. So I'm going to click here on this arrow to expand the bookmarks for every chapter of Revelation. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 22 in Hebrew. And let's read the Hebrew text, and I'll translate that for you. In the midst of the plains, and then continued on the next page, where al Hanachal and beside the stream, and by the way, I'm just translating on the fly. Um, the final translation on the right-hand side might be slightly different. So it says, um, and beside the stream, Ya'ale asfato, that grows up on its bank, Mize umize, on this side and that side, listen carefully, Kol, 
Eitz Ma'achal. Literally, that means every tree of food. Now, in plain English, that means all kinds of fruit trees. Isn't that very clear? Not one tree, all kinds of fruit trees. And then it says, where eights hachayim, even the tree of life. So, according to the Hebrew revelation, what is the tree of life? The tree of life is kol eights machal, every kind of fruit tree, or all kinds of fruit trees. Now, some people get confused, and they think if it says the tree of life, and it uses the singular form tree, it must refer to one single tree. But it doesn't work that way in Hebrew. In Hebrew, if you want to refer to all fruit trees together, you would normally use the singular form eitz, and that's used collectively, just as in English you say fruit, to refer to all kinds of fruit. And um, in Hebrew, for example, they would say waters, and in English we say water. So Hebrew and English is not always going to work the same way. And in Hebrew, if you want to refer to all kinds of trees together, you use the singular form eitz. Let me show you. We can already see this in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 says, Wayomer Elohim, then Elohim said, Deshe, let the earth cause to sprout vegetation, Aisev Mazriya Zera, plants bearing seed, Aitzpari, Osepari, let me know, fruit trees bearing fruit according to their kind. But in Hebrew, literally, it's a tree of a fruit bearing a fruit to his kind. This means fruit trees bearing fruit according to their kind. If you want to refer to all fruit trees together, in Hebrew, you'll use the singular form eight, and it doesn't even suggest a single tree. On the other hand, when the plural form is used, eight seem, trees, plural, that normally refers to wood, trees that have been cut down. The plural form can also be used to refer to a specific number or percentage of trees. But all trees, all kinds of fruit trees, is called eights, the singular, to refer to everything together. So if we read here in Revelation, call eights machal, where eights achayim, all kinds of fruit trees, even the tree of life, that singular form, eights, is the correct one to use to refer to all kinds of trees. And this solves the whole contradiction because all kinds of trees can grow on both sides of the river. All kinds of trees can bear many kinds of fruit. Um, so you can compare this with Ezekiel chapter 47 where it says on both sides of the river were extremely many trees. But in Hebrew it says extremely many tree because that's the normal way to say it in Hebrew. And this explains what and on it was twelve kinds of fruit. This is also explained in Ezekiel chapter forty seven. Every month it says these trees will bear fresh fruit. Every month that means twelve times a year. And so here in Revelation it just says twelve kinds of fruit. But that means between all kinds of fruit trees. There will be fresh fruit every month because it's not just one tree and it's not just one kind of tree. And then this last phrase, Wahaya Piryo Lemaachal, Wahalehu Litrufa, that's a direct quote from Ezekiel chapter 47. And its fruit will be for food and its foliage for healing. So this Hebrew revelation solves the whole contradiction about the tree of life. And it's not ambiguous. Why? Because it has this one little phrase, collates machal, all kinds of fruit trees, and that explains what the tree of life is, and it solves the whole contradiction. Now, let's also look at this verse in the Hebrew manuscript, just so that you can see that I didn't make this all up. So this is Revelation chapter 22. 
Let's zoom in. And we need to read in verse 2. It says, Be'emtsarechovot. In the midst of the plains, wa'ala nachal, and beside the stream, ya'ale al sfato, there grows up on its bank, mize u mize, on this side and that side, kol eight machal, all kinds of fruit trees, wa'eitz achayim, namely, or even, the tree of life. So the Hebrew revelation solves the whole contradiction. It's not one tree bearing 12 kinds of fruit. It's just that all kinds of trees are referred to as tree in Hebrew. And this solves the whole contradiction. So, let's sum up. What did we learn today? We've seen, first of all, that authenticity does not depend on the age of a manuscript. We can prove linguistically which one is the original and which one is the second-hand translation. We can do that with the Old Testament, and we can also do that with the New Testament. And so just as we saw that the Hebrew Old Testament has internal authenticity that was lost in the Greek translation, so we have seen today that the Hebrew Revelation contains clear internal evidence of authenticity, showing that the Hebrew text linguistically predates the Greek text, the Aramaic text, the Latin text, all those are translations from the original Hebrew. And then we've also seen that because the Hebrew revelation preserves the original Hebrew text, and it's not just an interpreted translation, it solves certain contradictions that exist in the Greek version. For example, the tree of life on both sides of the river. And you can read about more similar examples in our translation in the introduction. So I hope you found this interesting. Next time we want to cover another very important contradiction in most Bibles. Who is the morning star? Yeshua or Hasatan? Jesus or Satan? So until next time, Shalom in Yeshua Mashiach. <laughs>